time, isn't it? Yes, sir. It's good to see all of you. Oh, I don't know what to think. Bibliology, man, this is one of those areas in which growing up, of all the systematic theologies, bibliology was the one that made me go, oh, really? <laughs> I don't... I have my reasons, and hopefully um, you don't share my sentiment, um, but the reason why we wanted to have an intensive, in part, was to kind of build up, I guess, some of the uh, a level of excitement for the 10 o'clock class, um, because bibliology is one of those areas in which, you know, if you're not, if you, if you don't know what to expect, you can really um, kind of like not, you can lose interest very quickly. So this is part of the intensive. Luther and I really wanted to talk about this over the next, uh, over, over a conference period. And it fit almost perfectly within the scale, uh, the, the realm of apologetics. I'll just begin, begin with it right away. Uh, typically, bibliology is not an apologetic. It is typically a systematic theology. And it's usually like lesson number one in systematic theology. Why? Because you use the Bible to defend, to, to basically lay out systematic theology. Well, you better learn what the Bible is first. So this is actually kind of backwards in the fact that, that, that this is going to be the end of apologetics um, of the actual uh, le core lesson plans. I have some one-offs at the end of bibliology that I want to tackle. But when it comes down to bibliology, um, I, I view it as both a systematic theology and an apologetic. Uh, because you need to be able to defend the Bible. You need to be, the, the, the Bible is under attack more than ever today. And we need to be able to understand exactly what it is that we are reading and why we hold it to be true and defend that um, and along with many other questions. And so I really want to take my time, slow down over the next foreseeable future. I don't know if it's going to take a year or a couple of months, um, but I really want to get into a lot of the details of bibliology and the questions surrounding the text. So let's go ahead and open in prayer and then we'll go ahead and kick this off right away. God in heaven, thank you so much. You are the God who reveals not only mysteries like you did to Daniel, but you are the God who reveals yourself to your people, to the world, to us, through your word. And we are so thankful for that. We thank you for that. You have recorded your word, that you have preserved your word, and that we have today the most faithful, known, understandable, recognizable, and defendable book in the world. But thank you. God, thank you for your truth. We pray that we study it well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'll, I'll steal something from Eric. If you study bibliology, the one book that you actually use the least is usually the Bible. It's very interesting because you have to, um, you're basically going over a whole concept. Now, I, I try to use the Bible a whole lot in bibliology. But I did realize that we're not really going through books or passages of Scripture in order to substantiate stuff. Luther is going to do that more in some of the facts he's taking, but in the overall just course of study of bibliology, it's more dealing with how we got this book together. And But we also want to recognize that without the Bible, we can't defend the Bible. You need to be able to use the Bible to defend itself. I don't believe that I am required to defend the Bible. I believe the Bible defends itself just fine. But we also have to be able to answer the questions that people have in order to be able to, um, to give us a foothold. And, I, and again, this is more along the lines of questions for the believer and not necessarily for the unbeliever. So six lessons introducing bibliology and basically answer the question why we believe the Bible. And I believe the Bible, every book, every word, every sentence of it. Um, there are questions concerning certain parts, but... The, but the theology of the Bible, every single section of the Bible, every book of the Bible, the 66 books, is our word of God that he has revealed to us and therefore worthy of study. We're going to be going over overview of bibliology this, this next two weeks, making the case for the Bible from the Hebrew scriptures, making the case for the, for the Bible from the Greek scriptures, how we got the 66 books of the Bible. So we'll go over the history of it, understanding what it was, what it is not. Um, the, the another class will be is every word of the Bible inerrant, defending inerrancy. That will be a overview. This will be a very lengthy section within bibliology as we move forward. And making the case for proper biblical methodology from the Bible. Once again, this will be expanded on 
uh, once we get deeper into bibliology. This is bibliology lesson one overview. Very simple. Uh, the word Bible means book. Um, people have, you know, the such and such Bible, the such and such Bible, the gardening Bible, whatever it may be. All it means is book. Now they borrowed the word Bible to mean authoritative concept. When we say the Bible, we believe it's a compilation of 66 books, typically understood as the Old and New Testaments. We'll talk about that in a second. In fact, I'm hoping that this is the last time that I reference Old and New Testaments. Um, we do not believe in the Apocrypha or other additions to the Bible. We believe in the 66 books typically you have within in front of you. Now, if you have a book that has other forms of writings, such as Bell of the Dragon or uh, First and Second Maccabees or Concordance, those are not inspired books. Like the concordance part, didn't you? Yeah, you like that. See, she, she still laughs at my jokes. Uh, the Bible, uh, the contents cover over 6,000 years of human history. Not in full detail. Oh, that would be too big. But it, for basically, we have 6,000 years of human history. And yeah, and we also have, it speaks of events that have yet to occur. So there's a lot of prophecy involved. The word bibliology, bibliology is the study of the Bible itself. Bibleology. Study of Bible and all of its contents. What does it mean? This isn't systematic theology. We go over, over the content of the Bible. It's what the Bible says in general. It's how it got put together, how to read it, those kinds of questions. Again, what it is a systematic theology and an apologetic. In other words, um, you treat the Bible systematically and understand it, how it's put together. Um, also, it is apologetic, defending the Bible, understanding that it is God's word. And being able to answer questions, either even in your own mind, or if a question comes up in your own mind, so that you do not get shaken from a belief in the Bible. <clears throat> we answer questions like, "What is the Bible?" It's a simple question, but honestly, most people are like, "Ah, oh, it's a, it's it's a book, big book, bestseller," you know. But what is it exactly? Where did the Bible come from? We. You know, back in Moses, we didn't have 66 books. During Paul's day, before Paul's death, we did not have 66 books of the Bible. Did John put them together? Who put them together? Why do we have 66? Why not 61? Why not 72? Those kind of questions. How is it set up? Um, it, I always find it very interesting that the Hebrew Bible for Jews is set up differently than the English Bible. Why that change? And who made those decisions? And is that inspired? Is the order of the books inspired? Is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John the order you should read it? Or is it just something people put together? Is the Bible unique? We, this is kind of the apologetic of dealing with are there other scriptures out there that we, that, we, that we don't read and we don't really count as important. But you know what? Other people do. And therefore, we can consider those books scriptures as well. Or is the Bible unique? And why is it unique? <clears throat> can we really trust the Bible? Can we trust First Chronicles, Luke, Revelation, <clears throat> Genesis, Psalms, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon? We never, I will never teach Song of Solomon from this pulpit. Let you know right now. I do not take it as God's love letter. It is a love letter. Okay. We could talk about that maybe in a more, uh, uh, never. Um, I just know if you have a husband and wife, you could read it together. Fine. I could tell you about the content, give you some good ideas, but it's a love letter. Is the Bible inerrant? Is we believe in a plenary, meaning every single word verbal every single word inerrancy of the bible is that true is every single word true number and the last question and again this isn't all the questions give me a, this is a sample how should we read the bible i think the biggest issue today amongst evangelicals is not necessarily do you trust the bible or you believe the bible to be inerrant but the, people don't know how to read the bible anymore Again, I'll borrow something that I taught a long time ago and, uh, and, and moving forward. I've heard it several times and heard it again recently. The Bible is really the only book in which mysticism is greatly applied. In other words, you don't read a history book and go, hmm, I wonder what George Washington really meant. 
Yet when we read the Bible, you'll read all kinds of different stories or accounts, information, statements, and go, hmm, what do they really mean? Sarah and I had somebody in our office one time, and we were talking about the Bible, and we are pointing out some passages, having a read. She goes, you know, it's not what's written on the pages that matters to me. It's what's between the lines. And I'm like, yeah, that's not what we do here. I go, you, then, yeah, I go, you become the authority. You become the uh, arbiter of truth. You're the one that says, here's what is true, rather than just being objective. Understanding how we read the Bible allows us to have an objective point to it. This is what I believe concept of theology, eschatology, salvation, how we're supposed to live, all those questions. The main passage that we're going to be using for this particular um, grouping, um, you'll get to know it well. I have a few other verses that I will incorporate here because I think there are really some really good verses here. But 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All of scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training and righteousness so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. The Bible is usually divided into Old Testament and New Testament. However, this is an error. This is a big error. Um, normally, you turn the pages from Malachi, you turn the page, and, and you have a couple blank pages, and then you have New Testament. Like, you just, oh, now we're getting to the good stuff. And that is, that is really reduced in the minds of many people. And have caused many people to conclude that the new supersedes the old. Now, do we believe that in the New Testament, things are revealed that were not revealed in the Old Testament? Sure, it's called progressive. But you know what? Things happened back then, too. The Torah doesn't reveal everything. The Torah doesn't reveal David. The Torah doesn't reveal Israel as a kingdom in the way that it's set up. It has some clues. It has some information. But God progressively reveals himself through history, through the Old Testament, as well as the New Testament. You realize that the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, is basically just a compilation of Old Testament prophecies. Everyone treats it that's new. I go, that new? It's review. So when we believe that all scripture is profitable and the student benefits from studying any and every book, why do we make a separation, especially a hard one, like Old and New Testaments? When you say, oh, when people go, oh, that's Old Testament, what do they mean by that? You know that most people think the God of the Old Testament, mean, angry, fire, bleeding, blah, blah. New Testament, God's loving. and this is, this is the God we like over here. They don't understand the love and the judgment of God, both in the Hebrew scriptures and Greek scriptures. In fact, that is how we're going to refer to them, Hebrew scriptures and Greek scriptures. I would like us to remove from our vocabulary Old and New Testament because it gives a bad connotation about what the Bible and how the Bible is set up. In fact, if I were to put into categories and have a heartbreak, my heartbreak would be after the book of John. The Gospels are written and take place under what? The con that's right, under law. Now, they're not written under law, but they're written from that perspective. The contents of the Gospels are over there. That's interesting. So what are the Hebrew Scriptures? Well, the Hebrew Scriptures, otherwise known as the Tanakh, the Ta, the Nun, and the Ka. Um, the Ta, okay, Ta, Nak, okay, that's how it's Ta, Nak, that's how it's spent. The Ta is the Torah, uh, Genesis through Deuteronomy first five books of the Bible. So when you hear somebody call it the Torah, it doesn't mean Exodus 20. It means the entire five books of the Old Testament, uh, the first five books of the Old Testament. The noon is the prophets, the Navim. Now it's in the, in the Hebrew scriptures read by Jews. It's set up differently. It has Joshua through Kings and Isaiah through Malachi. That is the prophets. The Ka, the scriptures, the writings, the Ketuvim, I, I just had to list them because for our Bibles are all over the place. The Hebrew scriptures put them all together. Ruth, Esther, Daniel, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Song of Songs, Lamentations, Ecclesiastes, First and Second Chronicles, Ezra, and Nehemiah. In fact, First and Second Chronicles is actually last. The last 
book of the Hebrew scriptures read by Jews is 2 Chronicles, not Malachi. If you read 2 Chronicles straight through and then read Matthew, you go, it's just one story. And it is just one story, one account. I agree. I don't like the word story because it makes it sound like it's made up. One account. Oops. Luke 24, 44. Now he said to them, these are my words when I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things are written about me in the law of Moses, the law and the prophets and the Psalms. The word Psalms is basically just the word for scriptures. So when they say the word Psalms, oftentimes here, they mean the entire um, writings, the scriptures, which goes from Ruth to Second Chronicles. Prophets deal with Joshua through Kings, Isaiah through, um, and Isaiah through Malachi. So Jesus refers to the entire Tanakh, the entire Hebrew scriptures in Luke 24, 44 through 45. And then he opened their mind to understand the scriptures. The Greek scriptures also can be divided into sections. You have the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. History, Acts. It's kind of a misnomer because the Gospels are also history, but the Gospels are usually unique because it, it kind of elaborates the information concerning about the person of Jesus Christ. The Epistles, Romans through Jude, and Prophecy, Revelation. So Gospels, History, Epistles, prophecy that's how it's set up now, again we don't have uh, you know it, it's it goes without saying but a lot of people need to hear it so i'll say it the concordance are not is not is not the bible the maps are good resources not the bible the notes at the bottom of your page are good sometimes in fact i would say if you can get a bible without notes as far as interpretational notes don't get it especially for reading, because oftentimes you go, you read something and you hold the authority, not in what you just read, but in how it's explained. I can't tell you how many times I, I went to a, a Bible study. It's one particular Bible study I went to a couple of times. And how many times I said, well, Darby said, well, Darby said, I'm like at that point, I, like, I, 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 I got sick. I like Darby. I got sick and tired of hearing his name. I will quote Paul Meyer, Paul, Paul Miles here, not Paul, Paul Myers, two Pauls, both of them drive me crazy. Paul Myers, miss him greatly. I don't care what you think. I don't care what Darby thinks. I don't care what Schofield thinks. I want to know what the Bible says. What does it say? So why bibliology? Why study bibliology? What's the point? You know, we all kind of, we all have this book, especially here, right? And Bible churches, there's a reason why we're called Bible churches. We hold the Bible in a high esteem. So why study bibliology? We're already there. Really? Are we? Okay, here's a couple of challenges. Number one, people rely upon sources of authority for information, for data, for ethics, for worldview. Those sources are as varied as the people you ask. What, why do you think this? And they will tell you, if they're honest, why they think such and such information or data or information or worldview based upon various different sources, news, right? Science, religion, philosophy, parents. I, I love parents, especially today. That's not how I raised you. you. You notice their appeal to truth and their source of authority is themselves. That's usually stated, by the way, not to a five-year-old, but to like a 20-year-old. You know, that's not how I raised you. That's not that, that, is that truly the source of authority at that point? Teachers, mentors, reason, your ability to think through a problem. Now, we don't teach kids to do that anymore, but the good and the bad of teaching kids logic 
which is necessary, 100%, is that they become reliant upon their logic. That's not logical to me, rather than having their logic challenged by another source of authority. See, the Bible claims to be the ultimate truth, telling us about the creator of all things, the need for reconciliation with him, the means of reconciliation, and how this world ends. You realize I just covered most of the contents of worldview right there. The Bible is a history book, but the Bible also establishes our worldview. And it establishes worldview because we hold an authority. For unbelievers, for unbelievers, we have a question. Do you hold the Bible to be a source of authority? Will you allow your source of authority to be challenged? If your source of authority is a teacher, a mentor, your parents, your reason, or another religion, will you allow the Bible to be investigated, looked at, and have your source of authority challenged? Which one are you going to hold in high regard? What's the question for believers in Jesus Christ? What's the question? It's the exact same question. Now, when it comes down to salvation, how to go to heaven, most believers will hold the Bible and it, it is the only authority, right? When it comes down with economics, ethics, what's important? What do we value? What's our source of authority? Oftentimes it's our culture, our parents, sometimes our news, sometimes our politics. It's very appropriate concerning what's Tuesday, right? We get all in an uproar in politics. Do we have a biblical worldview over our politics? The study of the Bible is an establishment. So bibliology is an establishment and review of why the Bible is our source of authority. It's our source of authority for metaphysics. Now, metaphysics is simply the branch of philosophy that deals with the principles of first things, or the first principles of things, rather. First principles of things. Abstract concepts. Being. What, is it, what does it mean to exist? The Bible is the source of authority for that, not our reason. Otherwise, you're going to think you're a brain and a bat. And that's going to be like, hey, that's reasonable. How would you know you're not? And it's stupid because if they had the true source of authority, the Bible, that would not even be a question. You know who you are according to the God of creation. Knowing. Substance. What is this? What is material? What is immaterial? Cause, cause and effect. Are we deterministic or not deterministic? Identity, time, space, all these things are metaphysical. The Bible is the source of authority for all these questions, and all those questions can be answered from the Bible. It's also our source of authority for ethics, moral principles of right and wrong. Now, we get into the Moral versus ethic. I'm just going to throw ethics in there just as a general concept. But how do we know what's right and what's wrong? Again, typically when you ask a child, why is that wrong? Because mommy said so. And they're not wrong to say that. But as they get older, they need to learn the Bible to be the source of authority for ethics. So that when they start rebelling against mommy, they still have a better source of authority. Sociopolitical philosophy. The Bible is a source of authority for how we're supposed to run our society and how we're supposed to run our political environment. Now, we are not a theocracy. I don't, ask, I don't want a theocracy. Why? Because I don't want anybody that is prominent to be theocratic. They're all bad. So what is the best way to run our societies according to the Bible if God is not at the head? If we have a secular world, 
What is the way that we should run our communities, run your household, run the city, the state, the federal government, the world? What's our involvement there? Now that sounds good. And you're like, well, yeah, of course, Will. Don't we already do that? Well, I'm not going to sit there and, and, and say that anybody in this room or anybody watching online doesn't do that. However, I will go ahead and review the statistics. And we're not statistics. Each person here is individual. But we have to realize what's out there. An American worldview inventory of 2020. It's been four years, almost five, since this is taken. Okay? So I anticipate the numbers to be worse now. Okay? Four out of every 10 Americans believe that the Bible is, is the word of God and contains no factual or historical errors. That's a great number, 41%. Can you imagine us saying back in 1940 that 41% of the, of, the, of the people believe that the, word of, that the Bible is the word of God and is inerrant, no factual or historical errors? We'd be like, whoa, we're falling so far. When I saw 41%, I was like, wow, that's fantastic. Not really. We have less than half the population that holds the Bible to be anywhere near authoritative or reliable or even just good information. But when you start getting into the data, one out of those four, one out of those four, I'm sorry, one out of seven of those four. So once you start getting, like you go ahead and get, a, we'll go ahead and put those four and then you have eight. So eight out of 20 people believe the Bible contains the word of God, one person about out of those eight has a biblical worldview. They will say the Bible is the word of God and contains no factual or historical errors. But then you start asking questions. Well, what do you think about marriage? What do you think about abortion? What do you think about um, uh, the Bible as a whole? What do you think as the eschatology? They don't have a biblical worldview. They go, the Bible is the word of God. What's in it? I have no idea. The Bible is perfect. It's factual. It's no historical errors. It is the word of God. Hey, what does it say about this? I don't know. So of the 14% of the four don't know what's in the Bible or hold the Bible to be authoritative in questions about worldview. By the way, that you're looking at about 2% of America. 2%. About that held a biblical worldview. And now you know why we've fallen so far. How about evangelicals? Evangelicals defined by individuals who hold the Bible to be authoritative. They go to church on a regular basis. They hear the word of God taught. It's not social gospel. They consider themselves to be evangelical. Now, I've, I've lost my desire for even that word, but this is what they use. Of evangelicals, 21% hold a biblical worldview. They consider themselves to be evangelical, but when they start asking questions about what they believe about society and about eschatology and origins and salvation, they don't know what the Bible says. And they're evangelical. They're sitting in churches going, when did the Chiefs play again? They're not listening. They're not caring. They're not reading. They don't. They don't. They don't. They don't. They don't value the Bible. So when when I was kind of looking at this, I said, you know, what is our goal? What what is the point of this study? Is it just had not you know just well, let's just blow ourselves up with a whole bunch of information about the Nicene Creed? I, mean, I, uh, I don't care about that. I don't care about that. Those questions are necessary, and if we have to go over the various different groups of. Uh, people throughout history about how they taught, taught the Bible and how they got the Bible and what it put it together. We have to go over that and ask the question, were they right? We have to ask that. But all of that is just a, a, a layer on top to actually get to the real goal. The real goal is this. I want everyone here. Beth Haven Church, and those who are of us but not with us, and anyone else who may happen stands upon this, to value and love the Bible. To value and love the Bible.
That's number one. Because I believe if you value and love it, what will you do? Now, you'll, you'll do the rest, honestly. I, I, want, I want everyone to understand the basics of the Bible, the layout, the concepts, the general principles. I mean, everyone kind of knows the order of the books, especially in this church. Like, you, know, you can get from Genesis to Revelation, you can name them all out, but what's, what's in there? It's the a general idea. What's the, the concepts found there? Can you tell me the, the, uh, the, general, the general idea of what Ecclesiastes is? What's in 1 Kings? What's in there? What's the point? What are we going? What, what's the overall idea? General principles. This gets into the, I would say, the, the general concepts of worldview found within scriptures. Just a general idea. Obviously, we teach on a regular basis things that are more intense. And so, therefore, we get into the minutia and kind of really find and, and get very precise into understanding. But there are general principles we should all agree to very quickly. Number three, trust the Bible as the one true source of authority for life and godliness. In fact, I would say, and I, and, and this has been said from this pulpit many times, not just by me. Okay, so I'm quoting other people. That the Bible is usually held very high in regard to its overall authority, and we trust it, we like it, we, we refer to it. When we have a question, we go and find the principles of it. But amongst believers, we hold our reason and our thoughts, our experiences, our mentors, almost at the same level. We need to change that. Believers need to have the, the Bible as the ultimate source of authority. And if we have questions about what the contents are, then we start consulting with our mentors, our studies, and our reason. We've got to talk about those things because some things are in there are kind of difficult. But the Bible has to be the ultimate, the one true source of authority. We have to be able to say, if I need to make a decision that impacts my life, impacts my family, impacts my country, What's the, what are the general principles in the Bible and why we decide those things? Number four, know how to understand the Bible, the basics of biblical interpretation. That's part of bibliology. You have to be able to understand exactly how to read it because you can hold it in such high regard, love every word of it. But if you're allegorical in your approach, you're going to miss every time. You have to know how to understand the Bible. And I don't mean doing, you know, we all know what we do here. We get into the minutia, the words, the grammar. How do you just open it up and read it? How do, what do you do with it? I'm reading Genesis 48. What do I do with this? How do you read that? Fifth, I want you to read your Bible. If you value, you love it, you understand it, you get you, you become almost like this, this kind of like layman expert of the overall layout of the Bible. But we don't read it. <laughs> it's, it's lost. And why do I want you to read the Bible? I mean, you, you come on Sundays, three hours, Wednesdays, an hour, you know, do a couple here or there, conferences, conversations, maybe you take a mentoring class an hour. Don't I, don't I refer to the Bible a lot? Not enough. Why? Because reading the Bible will help you establish, develop, and refine a biblical worldview. I was counseling one time a couple that had a very deep philosophical divide and a political divide. And they go, what should we do? I go, develop a biblical worldview. If you develop the, world, the biblical worldview, the politics will solve themselves. But you go, you know what? We're going to hold the Bible in high authority. We're going to read our Bible. We're going to establish ourselves here. And this is what we're going to have a decision to make. We'll resort it to this book. Politics will, will, will solve itself. I believe that 100%. Number six, how do we get the Bible? And again, this is overview. Okay. The Bible is the word of God. Even though man is the instrument that God used to write the scriptures, it is inspired by the Holy Spirit. Man's the instrument inspired by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, it is God's word. Um, I do not believe it is dictation. I don't believe that God said, 
um, as like, you know, Moses is the penman. I think there are times in which that happened. Like, for example, in the book of Revelation, I don't think that Paul was taking dictation. I don't think that, uh, for example, um, the Ezra or Nehemiah, uh, Joseph, not Joseph, who am I thinking of? Joshua wrote the Bible. Uh, you know, they took dictation down. I think that they were inspired. God used their personality, their skills, their history and gave them what to write through inspiration. I don't know how that works. We don't have a point of reference, but I believe that 100%. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 through 21, but know this, first of all, that no prophecy of scripture, now when you use that word prophecy of scripture, no written down content of scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. So you take a look at when God, when people spoke from God, they were moved by the Holy Spirit and spoke. God gave them what to say, and they spoke. So therefore, it's not for us to decide what it means. And by the way, that also means that no prophet, no apostle ever said, God, talk to me. It happened when God wanted it to happen. It's not an act of human will. The Bible is the word of God. Man is the instrument inspired by the Holy Spirit. God's thoughts are revealed to the human author and are communicated in written form. I'm borrowing Paul Miles here. I think Paul Miles has done an excellent job in, in kind of developing these ideas and getting it down into a verbal and a graph that I can understand a lot easier. I like this. God's idea, God's thoughts, God's, God's word, okay, revealed to the human author's mind, or sometimes in a vision, sometimes it's spoken face to face, okay, to which we say when that mind, when he wants to write that down, is inspiration into the original autograph. God's thoughts are revealed to the human author and are communicated in written form. The original autograph. The original time Moses wrote down the book, the five books of the Bible, the Torah. When Paul wrote 1 Corinthians, he was moved by the Holy Spirit. God gave him information, put into his mind, and he wrote down what God wanted him to write to the Corinthian church. Discussion of this reality, discussion of this is, is this, did this happen in a particular book? Genesis, Luke, 1 Corinthians, Romans, Revelation. A discussion of this, is this true? is called higher criticism. Now, generally, people who want to debate the higher criticism of the Bible as a whole don't believe the Bible. So I was like, but, but there are times in which we need to ask the question, should Esther be part of the Bible? It doesn't mention God. What prophet wrote it? Where do we get there? How do we, how do we get this book? That's called higher criticism. It discusses the particulars of the book. Again, most people who take the Bible seriously don't challenge the Bible as a whole. They're just unbelievers. Now, higher criticism may also involve sections of the book. For example, there are a lot of people now that challenge the inspiration, the plenary inspiration of Genesis 1 through 12. As Hebrew myth, 1 through 11, as Hebrew myth. Creation, flood account, Tower of Babel, Hebrew myth. Not really, it's not really happened not really truly inspired by God. As you may already know, or even from understanding this particular concept here, we do not study the original autographs. We do not have them. You're like, well, if you don't have them, then why do we trust the Bible? Excellent question. That's the reason why we're here, okay? Those are the questions we have to answer in bibliology. We have, trans, we have translations of modern and Greek Hebrew compilations. What was originally written by the biblical authors was copied many times over many years. These copies are called manuscripts. 
The evaluation of manuscripts has resulted in various groups of people studying and deciding what the original autographs stated, resulting in what we consider to be the Greek and Hebrew scriptures. So when I could, when I deal with the Greek scriptures, which I deal with the most, all right, I deal with a couple of different different uh, compilations of what the people have decided. This is what the original autographs have said. You have, for example, the NA28, Nestle Arts. You have uh, the United Bible Society version five. I have version five, which means they had version four, version three, version two, version one. Why do they have different versions? Why do they have these updates? Because we find more information. Because we we have better questions to ask. When you take those modern Greek and Hebrew Bibles in, in Greek and Hebrew and then translate it, you have a translation. So we have the original autographs copying. We don't have the original autographs. We have the manuscripts. So many, many, many copies, manuscripts. From those manuscripts, we textually study them to find out what is the best understanding of what the original autograph stated in its word. <laughs> Therefore, we have our modern Hebrew and Greek Bibles. The modern Greek Bibles go through various different translations, and we have modern Bible translations. See, we all agree that most modern Bible translations we do not trust. We don't trust the message. We don't trust the Good News Bible. We don't trust the non-inspired version. Non -inspired version. All right, I get that again. The NIV, I don't trust it. I don't even trust the NASB. I think they're good. The King James Version, New King James Version, NASB, ISV, those are all very, I don't, I don't like the ESV, the, uh, the English Standard Version. I think it's highly theologically compromised. I think the NASB at times is theologically compromised. The Holman Christian Standard Bible was good, then they tended to the Christian Standard Bible, which got some messed up things in there now. I'm going, so in general, I like them. I like I have my ones that I use for the general reading and understanding, the general concept, but there's a question about what this verse says. Where do I have to go? I have to go back here, modern Hebrew and Greek Bibles. And how do I know that or trust that that's what it originally said? Well, then I sometimes go back and I do my own textual study to find out if there's a variant. I have to be able to either show or demonstrate why I believe this one variant better than the other one. How often does that happen in higher criticism and lower criticism? I'll be honest with you, not that often. The, the theological differences when it comes down to the variants within the Greek New Testament, the Greek scriptures, and the Hebrew scriptures is very low when it comes down to overall theological implications. So therefore, for the most part, I do what? I just, I, I, I look at it and say, hey, is there a variant here? And if it's a, it's a no, then I just, I, I don't go back and I do the textual criticism. I've done it enough over my years that I, I know where the major ones are. And we can discuss those when we, when we comes up. Well, we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about the major variants within the text and ask ourselves, is it original? And we're gonna we're gonna show you how to do that. We're not, we're not gonna do it a lot. We're not, I'm not taking you through an entire textual criticism class, but I want to do it at least a couple of different times to demonstrate how it's done, so that you can answer the question well through it in your own mind. And if somebody asks, so textual studies, lower criticism, are the processes by which the Bible student and scholar study the manuscripts record to get as close to the original autograph as possible. And there are a lot of people who've done a lot of work in this, but it's still incumbent upon the teacher to do this process when it becomes necessary <clears throat> now i'll be honest with you for the most part you're not going to do that and i want to encourage you to do so <clears throat> if you're you know want to get involved with that absolutely but most people will not it's it's sometimes it's a lot of tedious work to find out what you already suspected it's it's tedious work to find out what you already suspected you're just verifying some stuff um, Dr. Cohn calls this verifying the text. And then he'll go verify the translation. So sometimes we also have to verify the translation. Sometimes the translation isn't good, but the, the original text is good. Sometimes the translation and the text need a little bit of correction or at least a, an evaluation. 
Again, when the average student will not bother with either higher or lower criticism, but the student needs to understand what and how these are applied. <clears throat> Excuse me. They need to understand what and how these are applied so as to defend the Bible's inerrancy and authority. If you don't know anything about higher criticism and somebody comes up and says, well, did you know? And, you'd be, and you might get shaken. I remember the first time I heard that the woman caught in adultery, whoever was without sin cast the first stone, is not in the Bible. I'm like, oh, how dare you? Then I looked into it. I go, yeah, it's probably not in there. Does that change my theology at all about who God is? About the plan of salvation? About who Jesus is? No. Doesn't it? <clears throat> Ta -da. Oh, no, none. My bad. All right. Well, I'm going to end up there because I didn't realize it's 945. So I will close. And I don't worry. At the, you know, we're going to be doing a lot of bibliology. So and on my notes, you'll have in the, in the, the, uh, the intensive and beyond where we're going to go from there. So I just want to give you a good background of the Bible, how we got the Bible, and uh, we're going to go ahead and pick it up in about 15 minutes with more information concerning bibliology. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. Uh, it's truth that we can defend it and understand it, and it is the most reliable uh, source of authority that we've ever encountered, and, we, and it's all due to you. It is supernatural. It is supernaturally given and supernaturally preserved, and we thank you for that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.